Now we take on our second task. We want to show that Kepler's second and third laws are consistent with Newton's inverse square law for the force of gravity. Let's develop a very simple model of planetary motion. Here again is planet Q. And here is the Sun. We are going to imagine a very simple orbit, a circle. A circle, after all, is a very special type of ellipse, a completely symmetric ellipse. We call this diagram, by the way, a position diagram because it shows every possible position of planet Q in its orbit. Let's make the Sun a bit smaller, and let's notice that the displacement vector r represents the radius of the circle. Of course, because we're dealing with a circle, radius r is a constant. And we can describe the position of planet Q in terms of an angle, which we will call the angle of azimuth. So let's call the position here 0 degrees, which represents the position of planet Q at time equals 0. At some later point in time, of course, planet Q might be, for example, at 45 degrees azimuth. Let's divide the circular orbit into eight equal wedges, or segments. From now on, whenever I divide an orbit into eight wedges, keep in mind that I could divide it into a much larger number of wedges, and the reasoning would be the same. It's just that for now, eight is a much easier number to work with. Let's call the length of the arc for each segment S. Obviously, the areas of each wedge are also equal to one another. And because the areas are all equal, the times needed to sweep out each wedge are also all equal. Delta T, according to Kepler's second law, which Newton proved. The average magnitude of the velocity over this segment or the average speed, times delta t equals s. And if s is a constant and delta t is a constant, then the average speed over each segment is constant. Finally, because we could have divided the orbit into infinitesimally small segments and used the same argument, the instantaneous speed must be constant. Now, if t is the period of the orbit, the speed times t equals the total distance traveled during one cycle, which is 2 pi r. In other words, the speed equals 2 pi r divided by t. Now that we know the magnitude of the velocity, let's add in some velocity vectors to our position diagram. I should label each of these with a different subscript, but I'm not going to because I got lazy. By the way, the motion around a circle is always at right angles to the radius. Otherwise, the radius would not be constant and we wouldn't have a circle. Notice that the central angle for each segment is 45 degrees, obviously. And because the velocity vectors are always at right angles to the radius at that point, each vector in sequence is rotated 45 degrees to the previous one. Let me pause to remind you that we also can put in place here eight delta v vectors, always pointing toward the sun, of course. We will come back to these later. Anyway, now we have a sample consisting of eight velocity vectors in physical space. Let's take them out of physical space and put them in velocity space. 
Velocity space is a space where you can move vectors around at will, as long as you don't change their direction or magnitude. In velocity space, time exists if you want it to. So here we see that there is a sequence to the vectors. They transform into one another after a period of time which we decided to call delta t. As I said, we can move the vectors around as long as we follow the rules. And by moving them around, we can study their relationships better. For example, let's move this vector here, like so. Let's do Let's zoom in, and because we haven't specified the absolute magnitude of these vectors yet, we can change the scale at will. And even though we've moved the vectors around, their relationship to time remains the same. Each vector continues to transform into the next one in sequence in a period we call delta t. And the angles between each pair of vectors is always 45 degrees, so that when planet Q moves through 45 degrees of azimuth, the velocity vectors rotate 45 degrees as well. But what is delta t? Well, as you can see from our position diagram, it takes eight delta t's to make one cycle around the orbit. In other words, delta t equals t divided by 8, where capital T is the period of the orbit. Back in our velocity diagram now, we can label each vector if we want to, v sub a, v sub b, etc. Now we can reintroduce delta v vectors. In this case, we show delta v sub a such that v sub a plus delta v sub a equals v sub b. It's just basic vector addition. Now remember, this delta v represents the sum of a very, very large number of instantaneous delta v's. Nevertheless, the fact remains, in order to produce v sub b from v sub a, you have to apply a force over time to produce a change in velocity. And that change has to equal delta v sub a. Now that we have added in all of our delta v's, it quickly becomes obvious, since the magnitudes of all the velocity vectors are equal and they are separated by equal angles, the magnitudes of all the delta v's are equal. We have formed essentially eight congruent isosceles triangles. Therefore, the delta v's form a regular octagon with equal sides and equal internal angles equal to 2a, as illustrated here. Let's call this our delta v octagon. Now here's something that's really cool about velocity space. Let's say we know all of the delta v's, but we only know one velocity vector. And here it is. This is the velocity vector when q is at 0 degrees azimuth. And we indicate that by showing 0 degrees here at the top of our velocity diagram. Now we can add in the appropriate delta v, thereby producing a resultant, which is the next velocity vector in the sequence. and we proceed by repeating the process 
like so. This is a very simple matter for a circular orbit, but this process will come in handy when we deal with non-circular orbits. For example, let's say we want to know the velocity vector when q is at 135 degrees azimuth. We don't even have to draw in the intermediate vectors. We just add three delta v's. And presto! we draw in our new velocity vector. Think of the velocity diagram in this sense as a velocity factory. We can manufacture the appropriate velocity vector for any azimuth. So let's take this velocity vector and transport it back into the position diagram at 135 degrees azimuth. We keep the magnitude and the direction the same as we transfer from one diagram to the other. Now here's a question. What is the shape of a regular polygon with an infinite number of sides? Let me show you what I'm talking about. To keep things simple, we chose to divide our circular orbit in the position diagram into eight equal wedges. What if we divided it now into an ever-increasing number of wedges? We would have a really big number of wedges. Let's not say an infinite number, but let's say a Google, which for practical purposes works just fine. And so we could draw in a Google of velocity vectors. I'm only showing a small sample here, are eight familiar velocity vectors, or else things would get just too crowded. But you can use your imagination. With this really big number of velocity vectors, we can create a new velocity diagram in velocity space. You can see that the heads of these vectors essentially form a circle of radius v, and the circumference of that circle is 2 pi v. In between the heads of every pair of adjacent velocity vectors, we can imagine a Google of delta v's. In addition, when we consider that each velocity vector in sequence is the sum of the previous velocity vector plus a delta v, we can imagine each subsequent velocity vector appearing in time over an interval equal to delta t. Now because our delta v's and delta t's have gotten so small, let's give them a new name. To use the terminology of calculus, delta v is now dv and delta t is now dt. I am making the dv's red just so it's easier to see them. And if we have a Google of dv's, for practical purposes we have an infinite number. Again I ask, what is the shape of a regular polygon with an infinite number of sides? A circle! and we will call our circle the dv circle. The sum of all dv's equals the circumference of the circle, which is 2 pi v. Or, since we have a Google of dv's all the same size, we can say that 1 Google times dv equals 2 pi v. Similarly, the sum of all the dt's equals t, the period. That is, the period of time for one complete cycle around the velocity diagram. In other words, 1 Google times dt equals capital T. If we divide one equation by the other, the Googles cancel out, and we get dv over dt equals 2 pi v over t. You recall that we found a similar looking equation earlier for our position diagram. Now, 
we can use the expression for v from the position diagram and substitute it into the equation we just derived. And when we simplify it, we get this expression. Now we bring in Kepler's third law. t squared is proportional to r cubed. So we can get rid of t squared, and all we have to do is change the equal sign to the symbol for proportionalities. Once again, we can now simplify the expression. And since 4 pi squared is a constant, we can essentially get rid of it because we are now dealing with proportionalities. We find that dv over dt is proportional to 1 over r squared. But wait a minute, dv over dt is simply the acceleration. But wait a moment again. Force is related to acceleration as follows. Since force equals mass times acceleration, force is pro proportional to dv over dt, and therefore force is proportional to 1 over r squared. And so we have shown that the inverse square law is correct for the force of gravity, at least for circular orbits. We will assume it's also correct for orbits of any shape. And if it leads us to correct answers, we can assume that this inverse square law applies in all cases. Let's put our position diagram and velocity diagram side by side just to review what we have been doing. Notice that we have kept the directions of the velocity vectors and the delta v vectors the same in each diagram. Their magnitudes are also intended to be the same, although the scale in each diagram is arbitrary. Now, both diagrams evolve over time, and we want a reference angle for when t equals zero. As we have said, we therefore put zero degrees on each circle to correspond to t equals zero. The result is that zero degrees is on the right side of the position diagram and at the top of the velocity diagram. So when the r vector points at 45 degrees azimuth in the position diagram, in the velocity diagram, v sub b points at 45 degrees here relative to 0 degrees on the velocity diagram. We have now gotten to the point in our line of reasoning where even the great Feynman could not quite make heads or tails of Newton's reasoning. So let's pause here for a moment and consider Feynman's gift for making complex ideas simple and for delivering those ideas to the freshman physics students at Caltech University. As one admirer once said, When Caltech invited him to take over the introductory course in physics in 1961, they took an enormous chance on a theoretical physicist with no particular interest in students. What resulted, however, was nothing short of magic. His lectures went on to become a cultural classic, blending remarkably articulate explanations of science with poignant meditations on life's most profound questions, and they were eventually collected in the Feynman Lectures on Physics, which you can find in your local library.
It is worth noting also that Richard Feynman had a quirky and mischievous sense of humor. He recounts many amusing anecdotes from his life in his book, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. For example, during his time working on the Manhattan Project, he enjoyed putting his safe-cracking skills to devious use, to the consternation of his fellow physicists, who had been instructed to keep all of their notes and other documents in their own private office safe each night. Imagine their irritation when they found, one morning or another, that someone had broken into their safe in the middle of the night and had left perhaps a half-eaten sandwich or some other little souvenir. 